Hey everyone, welcome to a new video around how verifiable delay functions work. So basically in cryptography, it's really important to know how much time has elapsed between two events. And really that's kind of the key function of a VDF is we can verifiably um, ensure that there's been a delay and we can prove that through a function. The name's kind of uh, in it for itself. Now, the crucial part about the delay and why it's important, or like the use cases why it's important, is twofold. One is it can prevent manipulation. And the second is it can ensure fairness. I guess both sides of the same coin. But these are kind of like these two properties that we're really uh, going for. And when I say fairness, you could also uh, somewhat sub substitute this for randomness. So like a use case um, that would be really helpful is if you wanted to have like an on-chain lottery where amongst many participants, you have to select one at ra random. This is actually something that like a VDF would be really good for, um, where we can prove that there's a, a lot of computational work to find the random person but it's also very easy to then verify, um, whoops, wrong letter, verify uh, that that computation was done correctly. So it's kind of uh, a nice analogy is that it lets you guard against the speed of computers um, and the cleverness of individuals trying to game the system. So uh, and the really kind of cool property that they have is that they're hard to compute, but easy to verify and that's like a really cool property right it's like um very hard to attack very easy to d defend which is philosophically quite nice so anyway uh moving on let's get into how do they actually work so how do vdfs work cool so essentially the key thing about VDFs is that they operate on a simple principle. They require a predetermined number of computational steps to produce an output. So you'd imagine uh, each kind of jump that we made here is a step. And really this is the nth step. So the VDF will ensure that whatever computer is executing the, this has kind of been through every single jump in the sequence. And the core part of VDF is that it has to be sequential. So you can't jump from this step to this step to this step to this step to then that one. It has to be in a, the sequential order that it was uh, configured in, essentially. And the, like, the other reason why that's really important is you can't parallelize the, the computation. So like typically in computers, you can say, if I've got task one, oh, let me make this easier if I've got task one, two, and three, I can have three different computer threads basically processing this. In VDFs, that's not the case. Because it's sequential, you have to make the jump. And it doesn't matter if you put two computers or one computer, you can't actually make it faster. Someone has to do the work. Um, and that's kind of like a very critical component where the delay given that it's so hard to compute, um, makes it challenging. So kind of like the next level of detail is that there's a few steps to a VDF. So the first step is essentially the setup. So in the setup, you basically have a bunch of uh, public parameters that are generated. Uh, so you could, to, let's just say these are the parameters. And these parameters will then be used to verify the output that kind of imagining it output inside here, but it can essentially verify that the output was computed correctly. So there's some sort of like setup procedure that you need to go through. The second is then the input. So you'll have like a starting value, which is derived from a source of randomness. Um, now it's a bit paradoxical because you're like, well, if, the whole point of VDF is to generate randomness. How do we select a predetermined source of randomness? Now, 
that predetermined source of randomness can actually be, for example, like the previous state of a blockchain, um, because you assume that all the prior states were generated by randomness. There is a bit of a trade-off here, but after the first step, you can then actually get to uh, that state. So uh, out of all the different steps, you basically say, this is the starting one. Oops, yep, cool. Now, and the next kind of bit is once you have your starting point, essentially you have the slow part of the process that kicks in, which is a bunch of mathematical operations that are very time consuming that a computer must perform. So you can imagine like, let's say we have the number one and now after the one, number one, the set of instructions to reach the second step. Um, I'm completely making this up is we tell the computer one times three times eight to the uh, eight to the power of 65 times nine divided by six to multiply by the square root of eight times three times blah blah and you kind of this isn't a good example because uh you could technically parallelize parts of this but the idea is it's a really long hard computation and you can kind of use a rough benchmark and saying like if we know the fastest computer can work roughly with this it's still going to take at least this much time uh, to process it. And because you're going through the calculation in a very, very linear way, uh, it just means you can't parallelize it, as I kind of mentioned before. So anyway, once we have the input and then we have uh, the, uh, the setup and then the input selection, this is, whoops, the third bit here is the sequential computation which means the fourth bit. Oops. The fourth bit is basically proof generation. So once you get to the end of this output here, it will essentially generate a proof. And this proof uh, is very easy to verify given the setup that we mentioned here. In this proof here, we should be able to collect these uh, two things together. And now in a cryptographically uh, sound way, verify that this output uh, that we got from doing this computation was generated correctly. That output um, has a proof associated. So this is actually output plus the proof. And this proof uh, will essentially let us generate the output given the input and setup. So that it simplifies a lot of uh, processes within this, but going a deeper, uh, going a level below will get too mathematically hard to the point where I actually uh, am not at that level of skill. So anyway, hopefully you get the idea where um, we found like a really cl clever way to make computers do a bunch of hard work so we can prove it took them a bunch of time to do that hard work. Now, the next question that kind of comes along is, well, cool, like, what can we actually do, can we do with VDFs today? And that's, I think, a really great uh, question. So VDFs are used a lot in blockchain technologies. Um, so one of the examples is uh, proof of replication. Um, because in essence, you're forcing a computer to do some mathematical operations that can't be paralyzed. You can actually then actually prove that you've replicated data because if your data is this starting bit here and your output is therefore the same as your input, uh, you should be able to prove that you've replicated it without having to send this entire output. So proof of ref replication is one. Um, second is around resource uh, efficient blockchains. So VDFs can actually act as not a full replacement, but a partial uh, replacement for proof of work systems. Because in proof of work, you're randomly guessing any hashes to have an output that looks a particular way. In this thing, you're actually kind of doing useful mathematical computation. Um, so it can basically help uh, create efficiencies um, 
in a proof of uh, in an energy in- intensive way that isn't random and wasteful. Um, and the third is basically uh, public random beacons. Uh, so a lot of uh, technologies that rely on oops, uh, generating randomness, um, whether it's like lotteries or leaders and uh, consensus for protocols, uh, they basically use uh, VDFs. So in decentralized networks, it's really hard obtaining random numbers because it's very easy to manipulate the conditions under which you generated that random number. But by using a VDF, um, you can extend the time required to generate that number, which uh, prevents manipulation. So anyway, that's one, like how we think about using VDFs. And one of the, I guess, like to kind of close this off is that uh, one of the most prominent uh, use cases of VDFs today um, that I guess relates to previous or past videos, depending on, on when this gets uploaded, is uh, Solano. So Solano basically uses VDFs um, for its thing called proof of history. And the idea around proof of history is that you can uh, verify um, a uh, how long it's been between two events. So if I have event one here and event two here, one, two, I can ensure the time between these. And the reason why that's uh, important is uh, in Solana, each validator maintains uh, their own time. And because they maintain their own clock uh, by relying on the sequential nature of the VDF, they kind of don't have to synchro- uh, synchronize with each other to agree on time, right? Because if I know I'm in this state here and then I have to go to the state and this have to go to this state, we're not really saying like, hey, this happened at time t equals one and this happened at t equals two and this happened at t equals three. We can say this is the starting point, this is the first event, this is the second event, and this is the third event. As long as we agree that the computational... Uh, burden to reach this point in time will take a certain amount of time we know we will roughly be in sync um and that's kind of one of uh the really kind of critical properties that will uh, that helps a blockchain like solana uh process more transactions because there's less uh communication that's required between validators um so yeah anyway th- that's kind of like how a VDF works. It's, of course, greatly simplified, although uh, I'm not smart enough to go inside the math around it, but this is kind of like the core cryptographic primitive that uh, powers this thing. So, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, um, and I hope you found this video helpful.